All right. Here we go. So, sounds like we're ready to go. Hello, everybody. My name is Peter Pouliot. I work for Microsoft, and I work on OpenStack. I'm here today with Alexandra Pilotti from Cloud-Based Solutions, and we're here to tell you all the wonderful things we did during this development cycle for the Windows Server platform. And as you can see, it's the two great tastes that taste great together, as I like to say. So we'll leave it at that. So what we're going to talk about today is Windows as a guest and what we do to enable that in OpenStack, Windows licensing in OpenStack, Hyper-V and what you can do with it in OpenStack, as well as what's new for Windows in the Metaka release cycle. OK, here we go. How many of you guys use cloud-based in it over there? I don't see you necessarily with this light, but OK. We get a few hours in Yeah, definitely. So um, as you know, cloud-based in it is full Python code, OK? So very portable and everything. It was designed for day one for being portable across operating systems. We typically use it on top of Windows, and the new introduction in the Windows family is called Nano Server. OK? Anybody heard about Nano Server yet? OK. Great. Good. Very good. And, and for those who are newly indoctrinated, mm -hmm. Cloud-based init is the guest initialization agent for the Windows platform to give you equivalency to Cloud init uh, for your automation needs. OK. okay. So Nano Server, it's, um, we will talk a little bit more about Nano Server later, but it's uh, the first time that Microsoft introduces a new completely different type of operating system, uh, still based, of course, on, uh, on the same uh, core provided by the, the, the Windows Server Foundation. Okay? But uh, the important thing is that we, we have a different way of deploying application, different way of, um, of deploying uh, workloads on top of this, the, this Nano Server. The important thing is that cloud-based init will still be there. So you will have the same type of initialization, the same type of experience from this perspective. Supported Windows versions, so that's the new part. Of course, we will, uh, we will continue to support every version of Windows which is uh, supported by Microsoft. So Windows 7, 8, 8, 1, 10, and so on. I, I think I forgot to put Windows Vista, but I, nobody complained. I don't know why. <laughs> <laughs> Windows Server 2008, 2008 R2, 12, 12 R2, and most important now, Windows Server 2016, which is in technical preview. So nice thing about those technical previews is that they are a very nice way to introduce new features to the, to the audience. So feel free to download them, test them, try them, and everything. And of course, cloud-based and it works perfectly fine on those, which means that they work perfectly fine in any OpenStack deployment, OK? It doesn't matter if you guys use KVM or or Hyper-V, or S6I, or whatever else. And Nano Server, of course, 2016. It works also on XP in 2003, so it's totally unsupported. So we still have people coming on, the, on our ask.cloud.bz.t website to say, what about 2003? Well, time to update, I would say. Anyway, it works. So it doesn't mean, unsupported doesn't mean it doesn't work, OK? It's just the fact that we don't run continuous integration tests on top of 2003 today. Uh, Windows images. Um, well, we have um, scripts that will automatically deploy for you Windows images, including, of course, all the drivers, tools, uh, cloud-based needs, they've sysprepped them and everything. Um, how do we build them? Well, that's one of the important things we like and we believe in open source. So all of our scripts are available on GitHub, so you can see them there on the URL over there. We get tons of questions about those images, so keep on getting the flow of the questions, of course, or in ask.cloudbase.it. We have also Windows Server 2016 and Nano Server support, so it's actually the big deal at the moment. And, and just one more thing to add mm -hmm. to what Alexander was saying there. Those are our de facto mechanisms for creating cloud images of Windows, mm -hmm. okay? So just to be clear. Okay. So to uh, briefly, a uh, quick introduction on licensing with Windows and OpenStack. Um, essentially, you know, Windows licensing in OpenStack is actually surprisingly easy. We have, uh, you know, the, obviously the data center license, uh, which essentially will give you unlimited Windows instances on top of that uh, host. Um, essentially today with 2012 R2, it's one license per socket. However, as many may have seen in the recent Microsoft announcements, that's going to be changing from a per socket to a per core model with, I believe, a minimum of, of two cores, okay? It, this works, the, this licensing model, uh, it's applicable to, you know, Hyper-V, uh, KVM, VMware, or any use case that you may have 
uh, for the Windows operating system. And uh, essentially, uh, at the end of the day, it, it does result in a very cost-effective way uh, to utilize Windows in your environment. And for those of you who have uh, you know, massive uh, infrastructures, or if you're a service provider, we also provide the SPLA licensing, which is our specific, specific for service providers, okay, to enable you to uh, uh, license Windows across your infrastructure on a, on a, I guess, a more applicable basis. All right, so one of, the, one of the key areas that we run into, specifically with people who tend to use uh, Windows instances on top of KVM, is, a, is uh, an issue where uh, they tend to navigate towards uh, Vert IO drivers provided by the uh, Fedora and uh, you know, the Red Hat-based open source community. Uh, the problem with those drivers that you should all be aware is those drivers are currently uncertified drivers, meaning you will not be able to get support from Microsoft for those Windows instances. Okay, so we highly recommend you use one of the certified Vert IO drivers for Windows. Specifically today, you would have to go to your enterprise Linux vendor, namely SUSE, Canonical, or Red Hat, to obtain those certified drivers. And we can guarantee you, because most of the problems that we uh, hear about today with running uh, Windows on KVM, it's usually due to using a non, the non-certified drivers, which do not go through the same rigor and process of, of testing that we do uh, with our partners for those other drivers. So be, please be aware when you're deciding to deploy uh, your Windows instances on KVM. So unless you use Hyper-V, in that case you don't need well, it, right? Well, preferably yes. Okay. But for those of you who choose uh, to continue to use KVM, please be aware. So the, the key question here that we get all the time is, does Microsoft support OpenStack? Well, we support the use of any guest on top of our platform, OK? So yes, I, I guess uh, you know, ultimately, what does that mean? Well, we will support your Windows instances running on our hypervisor, regardless of the management platform that you choose to operate in. So if that happens to, use Open, if that happens to be that you use OpenStack, that's great. You can still get Microsoft support for those instances uh, in, in that use case. Okay. You cannot, we, we will not provide support for the uh, actual OpenStack layer. However, that's why we have cloud based solutions. Right? There we go. <laughs> so, if you have questions regarding any of these things or any topics related to Microsoft technologies and OpenStack, you can email openstack at microsoft.com to obtain uh, help and uh, you know, we'll help you regardless of whether it's, like I said, a, a technical question or if you uh, just have a general, uh, need general knowledge about you know, where to go next with your Windows in, in your OpenStack environment, feel free to use that and I can guarantee you, you will get a response. It works, I tried, huh? Yeah, sure. we've actually, most people who send email to that address, we change their perception of Microsoft uh, after we start interacting. Mm -hmm. So, you know, please feel free to reach out to us. We're here to help you. So, once again, let's let's start focusing in more on Hyper-V, our flagship hypervisor, right? And how we consume that in an OpenStack environment. Uh, just a question: How many of you guys uh, are using Hyper-V at the moment in an OpenStack environment? Yeah, see a few oh. hands. How many use Windows as a guest? Mm -hmm. okay. okay, cool, cool. All right, let's talk about this. So, WinStackers. In, um, in the you know, uh, OpenStack big tent, of course, there are lots of different projects, lots of different areas, and so on. And it's nice that actually different teams with different type of expertise actually are able to deal with their own uh, uh, projects, uh, having their own TPL, core reviewers, and everything. The same applies also for, uh, um, for Windows. For Windows, we have um, a specific team called WinStackers, okay? Deliciously cheesy, I would say, as a name. Uh, we chose it. Um, and that's actually where we put all the projects which are Windows specific. The first one, so it's actually very new, okay? So we created a group just a few, a few months ago when the DC actually approved it. 
the first project in, uh, in this umbrella is called OS Win, which collects all the Windows OS specific features. Okay? We are going to add now also networking Hyper-V, which previously was under Neutron, and now it's going to move as soon as possible under, under WinStackers as well. Okay? We will add here more projects uh, going forward. Okay? Just to be clear, this is not a Microsoft or cloud-based solutions project only. Okay? We like to have contributions for everybody, so we have already different partners, different companies which are contributing code and, uh, and helping with bug fixes and everything, so we are more than happy to accept contribution like we in every other um, OpenStack project, so we really believe in, in, in the open source spirit here. And one more thing to add to this, one of the main reasons we went down this route to create WinStackers was to help accelerate mm -hmm. our ability to bring new technology and features into OpenStack uh, without having to rely on other uh, teams uh, to provide, um, I guess, the review process to do that. So we have our own uh, PTLs that uh, can handle um, that for us in our own review uh, cores that will assist in this area. So it, it gives us some more autonomy within the project uh, specific for the Windows pieces that we need to influence. Okay. You want to introduce Awesome. Mm -hmm. So, Hyper-V and OpenStack. Mm -hmm. How many people here knew you could use Hyper-V and OpenStack? Perfect. What some of you may not have known is you've been able to use it for quite some time. Okay? And one of the things that we try to do is make sure that we can give you a user experience that with uh, the technology that we're bringing to OpenStack, that's very easy to use, right? Easy to set up. So for the Windows IT Pro, that means you know, the same type of experience from an installation perspective, right? Mm -hmm. However, you know, from a uh, pure uh, OpenStack perspective, if you're used to using OpenStack from a pure Python play, we actually can, uh, you can, on a Windows platform, uh, tweak and tune and uh, you know, work with that Python code in the same way um, you have on Linux systems. Okay, just a quick thing. Here is a quick snapshot from the installer that you can use to deploy um, OpenStack compute on, uh, on Hyper-V nodes. So the idea was always to have um, an experience very familiar with um, OpenStack DevOps, okay? And at the same time also very familiar with uh, Windows types of, um, let's say, CSAT means and so on, people used to, let's say, install things by using MSIs and everything, okay? The nice thing is that it will deploy all the related Python code whenever you need to make OpenStack running on top of Hyper-V. It can be fully automated. So, for example, we use typically Puppet, Chef, uh, Juju, of course, one of our preferred ones, and uh, SoulStack and many more, okay? So don't think that you just have to click to, <laughs> through these things. It can be fully, as I, as I was saying, orchestrated in uh, like any other modern type of cloud deployment. So, you know, one of the things that we pride ourselves at Microsoft is the continuous integration effort that we currently have going on for OpenStack. Many of you might not know, but we actually operate one of the largest continuous integration infrastructures in all of OpenStack. We consistently uh, are either in the top two or, in, unfortunately, this time around three, in terms of the amount of upstream votes that we actually commit to the core project. Okay? So, you know, from that perspective, we've got uh, currently today 10 active continuous integration infrastructures with plans to add more for each project that we're working on. Additionally, some of those are continuous integration for the uh, supporting projects like Open vSwitch, uh, Cloud-based init, uh, that we consume as part of OpenStack, okay? Um, additionally, you know, we are looking to, as I said, grow, continue to add more infrastructure, and have commitment from our management going forward that this continuous integration infrastructure will operate to support our efforts within OpenStack. So we can assure you that we're going to keep testing OpenStack with Windows uh, in the same vigor that we're doing today going forward. OK, time to talk a little bit about Mitak, right? So what we have new and everything. Um, we worked a lot, so we have a lot of new features coming with this, with this release, which, by the way, for Hyper-V just got released at the beginning of this week. So if you can go to our website on cloudbase.it, you can download already the, the Messiah tried. Very important, it doesn't matter what OpenStack uh, distribution, to call it this way, you're using at the moment, whether if it's 
you know, any of the big names that you, that you know, or if you just uh, deploy it by yourself from scratch, or if you're using DevStack and so on, it doesn't really matter. So you can just add Hyper-V compute nodes to any of those, okay? So don't think that you need to have uh, an entire Windows-based OpenStack to try it out. You can have your own uh, OpenStack with, I don't know, one, two, three, whatever, compu Hyper um, KVM compute nodes. You can absolutely add Hyper-V nodes as well, so you can, they can perfectly live side by side. Our goal, once again, with all our effort is to maintain an interoperable footprint when we add Hyper-V into your existing OpenStack environment. Okay. From this perspective and talking about interoperability, you know, you can have uh, your Hyper-V boxes, put them side by side with the KVM, but if they have different type of SDN um, solutions implemented, they will never be able to talk, okay? So you cannot have like a, a, a Linux VM running on KVM talking to a Windows VM running on Hyper-V if they don't have an underlying networking implementation that will allow you to do that, no? So that's actually the main reason why some time ago we decided to port open vSwitch to Hyper-V, okay? How many of you guys use OBS? Hmm. Okay. It's a good amount. Good amount, as I was expecting. So it's a de facto standard for SDN, so it's not something that you can just ignore. It's actually evolving very fast, very well, and everything. So it's, it's, it's a great way to, to make sure that different type of hypervisor can, can communicate among each other, and also different type of network equipment, and so on. Great interoperability, Hyper-V, KVM, ASICSI, and so on, VNSX, tunneling, VXLAN, GRE, STT, and so on. We have a new ML2 plus an OVS agent. So the same OVS agent that you guys are running already on, uh, on Linux works on Hyper-V in the same identical way. Uh, it's compatible with OpenDay like and NSX. And in theory, mm -hmm. any OVS DB compliant yeah. uh, SDN controller. Now, once again, just to be clear, we're mm -hmm. talking about having a use case where people are consuming uh, KVM with OpenV switch within an OpenStack environment, we can seamlessly plug in Hyper-V as a compute node without changing any underlying network architecture. Okay. So the news here is that we have the new OpenV Switch 2.5 release, okay? It introduces a ton of new features, actually way more than what I could fit here without going over time in a matter of a, a few slides. So we have, um, just to be clear, we have all the type of uh, encapsulation that you will expect, so VXLAN, GRE, STT, MPLS, and so on. This is a stable release, okay? We had a previous 2.4, which was the first one that we introduced, and we always marked it as beta. The reason is that it was the first version, so marked as experimental. So you were, of course, always encouraged to test it, try it out, but we were not encouraging people necessarily to use it in production. No? 2.5 is a stable release, so meaning that we, hope and encourage you guys to use it in production anytime. So we consider it as stable as we have, for example, the current networking Hyper-V um, agent, which is based on the, on, on the native Microsoft networking stack, okay? And once again, should mm -hmm. you want to use it in your production environment, mm -hmm. you can feel free to work with cloud-based solutions to help yeah. uh, you implement that. Among the many features that we have, for example, we have also a LACP support. This is something that was not available in the, the previous release. So that's great, actually, for um, high All availability and everything. Yeah. <laughs> no, okay. All your bonding needs. So, okay. uh, Alessandro alluded to earlier Nano Server. Nano Server, from my perspective, is being a relatively new employee to Microsoft, but a long-time user, right, uh, is a revolutionary step forward in how we uh, distribute and consume Windows Server, okay? We're talking about a sub 500 meg footprint that uh, contains the core functionality for hypervisor and storage and allows you to, uh, you know, do things very similar uh, in those uh, smaller footprints that you would do with uh, Linux, okay? So highly efficient, highly tuned, a lot of the uh, a stripped down to provide the type of compute environment that a lot of us expect today when we consume, you know, or, or build out cloud infrastructure, okay? It's basically Windows without Windows, no? Yeah, <laughs> it, it actually has a, has a shell. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it has no graphical user interface. You can use PowerShell, for example, remoting to connect to it and so on. So for those of you who are, who are used to using Windows Server Core, we're talking about an even smaller footprint than that, right? Like yeah. tiny. Okay, storage space is direct. Ever heard of this? Yay, some hands. Very All good. Right. So storage space is direct, it's a great technology. It's the idea that you have a full share not in storage, exploiting the 
uh, the individual disks that you will have uh, on uh, traditional commodity servers, okay, SSDs, SATA, SAS, whatever you have, okay? And um, all together, those disks will basically create an in a single storage pool that will be distributed across the nodes, okay? The main idea is that this way you can have a uh, regular servers, no need for traditional expensive SAN type of storage, okay? While still have all the benefits of having a type of distributed storage, okay? Um, data mirroring, so all your data will be basically mirrored across multiple nodes, so if you just plug, plug the plug from uh, one of those servers, it will still work, okay? All the mirroring, so all the traffic will be based, of course, on uh, on your network adapter, so we highly recommend to use a 10 or 14 gigabit NIX, okay? Uh, but that's again very commodity stuff in nowadays enterprises, right? It uses or leverages scale out file server, which is based uh, on the SMB3 technology. And uh, you can also use uh, SMB Direct or NDMA, NDMA enabled uh, adapters, NIX, so that you can exploit that extra bit of performance thanks to the offloading that this provides. Okay? Once again, we also, you know, mm -hmm. as part of this, provide, uh, you know, Cinder integration with that technology mm -hmm. to help enable OpenStack, Hyperconverged, Hyper-C. Okay. So just a couple of notes here about Hyperconverged. It became, of course, a very hyped word, okay? But it's definitely the direction in which everybody's going to go in terms of deploying because the advantages are clearly overwhelming. I mean, it's not something that you can compare it to the old traditional way of splitting storage from computer and so on. The idea is simple. All the nodes are identical. They have storage, compute, networking, and so on. If you need to plan um, new capacity, no problem in saying, okay, I need 30% more um, storage nodes, 40% uh, compute, and so on. You just take the same identical ones, and they will just deploy in production. Then you can use uh, bare metal solution, like for example, mass, like we usually do, or ironic and so on, and you deploy your nodes from, from the bare metal app, okay? So also very agile, very efficient and so on. We already have, based on Windows Server 2016, uh, an, an OpenStack uh, distro that you can just um, um, deploy on your, on your environment. It's based on 2016 which is not yet available in production, as I was saying before, it's in technical preview, but feel free to deploy it for proof of concept and whatever. What we typically uh, tell our users and customers is to deploy a proof of concept today, and then in the moment in which 2016 will go RTM, so will be available for general availability, you can just flick a switch and redeploy automatically all the node with a, with a new version and just go in production with it, okay? But already, you will already be used to it you, or it, it, the environment would be already fully test driven and so on. Okay, well, we already talked about this. Um, PyMine. Okay, so Python on Windows is an interesting topic, okay? It works great. So Python is definitely a multi platform language, so there is nothing actually that prevents you to use it on Windows, okay? But the underlying library, which offer interaction with the operating system, except, for example, C types, um, depend, of course, on some module which are modules which are available from the community. One of those leverages the so-called WMI APIs, okay? The current module that everybody uses on, and it's available on PyP and everything, is a WMI module based on PyW32, and it was written somewhere in 2003, so it's based on a very old implementation of WMI. That's what we used to use until the Liberty release, when we got really fed up by how slow it was, this approach, okay? So we decided, okay, stop a second, let's write a new module that will actually leverage the new stack, the new uh, um, management API stack, which came with uh, 2012, it's called Managing Infrastructure API. And um, it also was designed to be a full drop-in replacement for the old module. So if you had the applications which were using the old WMI module, uh, you were simply able to replace it with a new one and just go on, okay? So, for example, that's the case of OpenStack. You take a Kilo or Juno release, you deploy the new module, and everything just works. But it will be extremely faster, <laughs> okay? And let's talk a little bit about how much faster. <laughs> Here you go. This is an example of how fast we got from, uh, uh, from the previous release to the current one. Okay, the performance takes, the, takes care not only of the fact that we introduced PyMI, but also the fact that we introduced uh, a lot of additional improvements 
uh, driven by the fact that we are finally able to, to, to rely on a way faster underlying module for doing this, okay? So on the left, you can see the two almost vertical lines that uh, represent uh, the difference between uh, uh, the old WMI implementation in Parmai. This is actually for one specific uh, um, um, OpenStack um, uh, service, which is the, the Neutron agent, which was always one of the biggest bottlenecks, when, especially when, when deploying um, um, security groups ACLs, okay? So when you have hundreds of machines, it used to be very, very slow, okay? Now you see a completely different curve. If you see on the right, um, especially with uh, increasing the number of threads, there is an enormous difference, okay? Uh, PyMy, uh, you know, Python is notoriously a non-multi-threaded language because you have some issues with uh, the fact that only one thread at a time can own the so-called GL, so it's um, common from all other interpreter languages as, as well, like Ruby and so on. We overcome this issue by leveraging a lot of parallelism in the underlying C++-based uh, uh, module that we developed specifically for this. So it's C++ under the hood and Python over, okay? So the best of the two worlds. The results, we will publish, of course, uh, some, uh, some benchmarks pretty soon. We use Rally for doing all the banks, so hundreds of machines deploying in parallel and everything. And um, we are talking at that 10 times um, plus, actually, performance increase from, from the older model. And uh, not only we, at this point, we are way faster with Hyper-V with Windows workloads, so we are talking about 20% at least faster than, than other hypervisors. And, uh, but we e even managed to get faster with, uh, with Linux, okay? That's especially thanks to all the improvements that happened also in the Linux cast with the LIS components. Okay, I will stop here with the comparisons. Otherwise, it feels like I'm comparing <laughs> detergents or stuff like that, but that's the idea. So one of the other key areas that we had been approached uh, to help enhance uh, support within the community for was specifically around the fiber channel support for uh, Windows Server within uh, Cinder and OpenStack. So we decided to work together uh, with HP to actually build that support. We run the CI for that in the Cambridge uh, continuous integration infrastructure. And uh, essentially, as a result, we not only added the three-par fiber channel driver uh, for fiber channel, but also for, for iSCSI, okay? And it gives the same user experience across um, this project as it does for our other uh, sender projects, okay, from a storage perspective. And it allows you to utilize those assets if you have them in your OpenStack environment with your Windows uh, guests and hosts as well, okay? We utilize uh, pass-through uh, for boot from volume. Uh, also, vSAN support will be uh, coming soon. Coming actually, soon. Yeah. Yep. The reason why we went to pass-through for this one is that we needed also boot from volume, from, which is not available in, in, in the vSAN support itself. Yep. So uh, you know, additionally, we add uh, multi-path I.O. support. Um, and as I said, iSCSI support. Uh, we leverage um, the host-based MPIO. Uh, and it's compatible with Windows, supporter, uh, Windows server-supported targets. That's a pretty important topic. Just a question, how many of you guys use containers? Okay. How, how many of you knew that Windows Server containers are coming? Awesome. Well, that's great. Perfect. So from our standpoint, you know, with all this momentum that's uh, around now behind containers and within this ecosystem, we wanted uh, to ensure uh, that we could take advantage of that as well. So, uh, you know, with the work that's coming out of the Windows Server team on containers, you know, we, they've done excellent work to integrate uh, Docker APIs on top of that. So if you're, you know, just from a straight Docker perspective, we're talking about Docker files building Windows containers, right? It's pretty cool. Um, you know, the uh, support for that container technology was merged into Nova Docker. So if you want to use it within your Nova deployment, you can do that and get Windows containers out of Nova. All right. Additionally, we'll be adding, we've added support for Magnum. So when Windows Server 2016 is released, you can implement Windows containers on your OpenStack environment using the same technologies you're using uh, in your uh, Linux environment today in your OpenStack deployment. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, we are 
investing a lot on containers, so Magnum and so on will be an important area of development during, during the upcoming cycle. So if you have any questions, please come forward and ask us, okay? So not yeah. only Magnum, also for example, Kubernetes, Mesos integration and so on will be definitely on top of the list. So, so one more thing to add here, when we talk about mm -hmm. containers, one other key uh, critical feature that's coming in Windows Server 2016 is the ability to nest, such being we could actually run Hyper-V in a container, mm -hmm. okay? Um, so that's, uh, from, our, from our standpoint, uh, having uh, not had nested virtualization for quite some time, we're very happy this is coming because it's going to essentially hopefully make our CI life a, a hell of a lot easier, right? Mm -hmm. so. All right, next topic, Hyper-V failover clustering. So you know the story with uh, pets and cattle, right? So, or as a friend, of mine says uh, cats and petal. <laughs> 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 the, the, the main idea is that uh, OpenStack and modern cloud designs are made for lots of machines in which the individual machine, the virtual machine or container or physical node can fail anytime and your application keep on going because the application themselves are designed to be full tolerant have availability, with high availability in mind and so on. But what to do with all the legacy type of um, deployments that you have, okay? So you cannot just, you know, draw a line, throw away whatever you have and just start fresh, you know? So we have a lot of requests of uh, companies and users saying, okay, well, I have, you know, my mail server, my database and everything. I would like just to take them and make them work on OpenStack, just, you know, for consistency with the rest of all the new and shiny workloads that I have. So that's actually where Hyper-V failover clustering comes in hand, okay? Um, it's basically host-based fault tolerance. This means that whenever one of your Hyper-V nodes dies for whatever reasons, or if you need it to put in maintenance, you will just be able, your virtual machine will keep on running by simply move automatically on a different node, okay? Think about line migration, but triggered by some automated um, system, okay? Um, of course, it's much more than that, okay? But uh, that's the main topic. So if you just shut down, for example, one of your nodes, all your machines will automatically migrate it somewhere else. It's called node draining in, uh, in, uh, in the jargon. Uh, and if it crashes, they will automatically restart on another node. So okay, this is called failover. It integrates seamlessly with Nova because one of the uh, uh, traditional discussions around this topic was always the fact that what happens, I mean, when you have the Nova scheduler taking some decision and the cluster saying something else, okay? The idea here is that the Nova scheduler is always what commands, okay? The, 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 the cluster will simply fail over and update the Nova configuration. So if your virtual machine is running on node A and fail over is on node B, our Hyper-V driver will always tell to Nova, look, this specific Hyper-V node, uh, this specific Hyper-V virtual machines is now on host B and no more host A. So it will always be consistent and transparent. Most important, not only it will give peace of mind to your users, but also to you as deployer because it comes out of the box with Windows. So it's just one of the features that it's very easy and simple to deploy. We have a blog post that we published this week on our website if you want to learn more. All you need is a domain controller, and for the rest it will just work on the free Hyper-V um, server and whatever other Windows uh, server version that you guys might use. Um, it supports all the networking options that we have, for example, OpenV switch or the native Windows Server networking, Hyper-V networking, and it supports also seeing the SMB volume, so all your volumes will remain attached actually to your machines. When do we use it? When um, the, your VMs don't, don't necessarily run fault tolerant applications, traditional enterprise apps that delegate fault tolerance to the host. And again, as I was saying before, it's a very common request from our users. Next topic, so I'm going quite quickly on top of the next uh, list. How many of you guys use VDI in OpenStack? Let's see. Oh, there's yes, a couple. There's some Great. hands, pretty good. So, Windows Server and Hyper-V are definitely the best platform out there for VDI, okay? So Windows, especially for Windows workloads are down, running on top of Hyper-V, okay? Without taking anything from other competing platforms, of course. Uh, there are a lot of new additions for remote effects in Windows Server 2016. So remote effects allow you basically to share uh, your GPUs running on the host between uh, virtual machines running um, on the host itself, okay? 
So you can have up to one gigabyte of uh, dedicated RAM with, of course, the other options you have here. And you can also have shared VRAM, so we can basically overcommit the VRAM that you have. Supports generation one and generation two VM. And very important, supports OpenGL and OpenCL API support, okay? So if you have some scientific type of, uh, of um, uh, let's say, workloads, uh, that's perfect, okay? Very useful in both in private and public clouds. We have also videos available and a blog post available at the link which is available there. And actually down you see also a link with, uh, with the video showing the big difference between, uh, between the two, okay? Shielded VMs. Uh, just a quick note about this because we, we didn't publish it yet. We will publish it extremely soon. I mean, I publish it as in available in the code base for, uh, uh, for, for OpenStack. This is a very unique Hyper-V feature and it's a great feature. The main idea, the main reason behind is that you cannot really trust the underlying host, your, your hypervisors in a cloud, okay? What happens if a hacker will take control of your host? In normal traditional environment, it will simply own all your virtual machine running on top of it, okay? So if you have some significant amount of um, sensitive workloads, that's going to be a problem. These solutions, which is based on isolated user mode, BitLocker, TPM support, Hyper-V, of course, and so on, will allow you to make sure that whatever happens to the underlying host, there will be no way to taint and uh, um, basically eavesdrop in the content of the virtual machines themselves. Okay, so full encryption of the data and uh, basically an extremely tiny attack surface that won't allow any attacker but can compromise the underlying host partition uh, kernel or user space to access the virtual machines themselves. Very, very interesting feature coming with Windows Server 2016. As a bonus, you also get a VTPM support, okay? If you want to have a TPM in your guests. On networking, you want to talk about this one or? Uh, so for Windows 2016, the networking model changes mm -hmm. slightly. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, we want to take account for that in our work going forward with OpenStack. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a REST API based uh, interface. Mm -hmm. uh, the controller uh, runs on uh, Windows Server nodes. Yeah. And uh, it's, uh, a there's a dedicated forwarding extension, VXLAN offloading, okay. and uh, some OVSDB compatibility from the new native interface. Okay, so this stuff will come as well in Newton. So this is, of course, a new networking stack coming with, um, with Windows Server 2016. So it's, of course, our um, pleasure and duty to say so, to, to include it also in the next version. So, of so much like the existing uh, mm -hmm. uh, networking model that we can consume today, out of the basic Windows Server in 2012 R2, hmm. we will, you'll also be able to consume the new networking model that will be presented in 2016 within your OpenStack environment as well, natively. Okay, okay some other minor updates. That, so all this stuff is already fully supported in, uh, in OpenStack Mitak, okay? So if you download our installer. Um, VNIC hot add, meaning that you can add a NIC, also a virtual NIC to our running virtual machines. You can have secure boot for Linux VMs. I'm a big fan of secure boot, okay? Previously, it was available only for uh, Generation 2 um, uh, Windows VM. Now it's also available for Generation 2 Linux VMs, okay? All you need is an API type of partitions and it will just work. We have finally nested virtualization. So you can run uh, a VM uh, with Hyper-V running on top of Hyper-V and you can play with all this inception as much as you want. The main idea, okay, this sounds like it's just like a crazy lab. Um, mad scientist scenario. In reality, it's extremely useful, useful for testing so that you don't have to deploy. For example, if you want to test OpenStack, you can just test in OpenStack entirely inside of virtual machines without having to deploy it on physical nodes, okay? Uh, something else, okay, REFS, a new uh, file system from, from Microsoft with additional features, fully support us on, uh, on um, storage spaces direct. And that's actually the main list. There are some other minor things, but let's say those are the ones in which we mostly focused. So some time back, mm -hmm. we decided to uh, work to bring Juju to the Windows platform uh, and Juju Charms as well. So what that means is for those of you using uh, Juju as your orchestration mechanism, we have a, a significant amount of uh, Windows workloads and traditional Windows IT workloads available for consumption in that automation model. Okay. Here is actually a list of the catalog available on our, our website. Basically all the type of uh, Windows workloads you might actually think about. SQL Server, SharePoint, uh, Windows clustering, Active Directory, 
IIS, uh, WSUS, SMB, VDI, and so on. So all the main things that come to mind. And for, for those of you who may not be using Juju, mm -hmm. we also have this technology available mm -hmm. as heat templates. Okay. On the opposite side of the spectrum, we have a small project, which is called Vimagine. Um, the scope of this project is to allow anybody running Hyper-V, including, for example, a Windows 8 or a Windows 10 laptop, okay, to run OpenStack on that specific Hyper-V box. Okay? It will create basically a, a, a VM running a, a Linux-based controller, and it will use the host itself, could be your laptop or just a server or whatever you want, okay, to, uh, as a compute node. This is actually most probably the fastest way to, to, to test OpenStack today. I mean, all you need is your laptop or, or a server that you have around on Atimor. It runs even on a surface, so it doesn't really need too many resources. And it's fully guided, automated, and everything. OK, just a couple of notes about Azure Stack. Anybody heard about Azure Stack? OK, a few hands up, OK. Azure Stack is a new product and, let's say, project coming from, from Microsoft. Uh, we receive a lot of questions about what are you guys doing with Azure Stack, what about Azure Stack and OpenStack and everything. Well, our point, our standpoint as cloud-based solutions, that it's, uh, there are two completely independent projects, okay? It offers an, the Azure REST API, the ARM API on top of your on-premise uh, on cloud. Um, uses Windows Server 2016 operating system features, so the same ones that, uh, that we have also underlying OpenStack. And we also offer uh, a service to migrate between OpenStack and Azure Stack, for example, if you want to experience um, how, how to work on both environments. It currently is available in technical preview. And uh, we work definitely on both environments. And we see our customers and users asking questions, evaluating also the idea of running both of them at the same time. Okay, there is nothing wrong with that. So if you have the intention of deploying Azure Stack, please come and ask us the questions, especially if you plan to have both environment deployed in your, in, your, in your scenario. OK. So once again, as we said earlier today, we do support your workloads, OK, if they run in OpenStack. If you have questions specifically about the Microsoft technologies, you may email openstack at microsoft.com, and we will get back to you to help you and answer those questions. And if you have questions regarding any of the cloud-based technologies that we've talked about today, you can go to ask.cloudbase.it and get answers uh, you know, in the open source channels that are available there. OK, we are slightly over time, plus uh, we are what remains between uh, here and your parting, and also our parting. So if you have any questions, that's the right moment. And if those who would like to ask questions, could you please step up to the microphone such that we may get it uh, yeah. recorded in the session? You have a question? Go ahead. Hey guys, I'm Rich Dole from Box uh, Cloud Engineering. Firstly, great work on the Windows stuff, love it. Mm -hmm. um, quick question, you mentioned Open Daylight integration. I've got a fairly extensive deployment that's using Open vSwitch and OpenFlow 1.3 or 1.4 to provide mm -hmm. overlay and connectivity without having to use STP and no mm -hmm. controllers. Is that scenario supported in your Open vSwitch implementation? Definitely yes, because we have the full compatibility for both OV OVSDB and OpenFlow. Okay, so the excellent. fact that we have 2.5 running on the, on the node itself doesn't mean that we don't have compatibility for the previous OVSDB versions. Okay, thanks, yeah. thanks very much. Very welcome. Great. Thank you. Go ahead. If I have 40 uh, compute nodes running under uh, KVM, mm -hmm. in order to run nested um, Hyper-V, I'd have to replace some of them with Hyper-V as the huh. so the KVM it, with Hyper-V? Well, KVM already supports a level of nesting. I'm not sure. I remember mm. in the past. There, no. no, E6i so supports very well, for example, um, um, or works very well, which is unsupported. Um, nested Hyper-V, but uh, KVM is not yet necessarily there. Yeah, I thought there okay. was some patch. Uh, yeah, yeah. to be honest, I'm not uh, mm. that well-versed, but I... Uh, so I'd have to take some of the KVM nodes and replace them with Hyper-V. That's a great idea. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> and when you want help doing that, you can email <laughs> openstack at microsoft.com. Sounds reasonable. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Go ahead. Does the uh, recent work to port some you Ubuntu user land stuff over to Windows signal mm. adoption route for some of the traditional so, Linux-based server technologies in Windows Server 2016? So if you're referring to the recent announcements about the bash on Windows, let's clarify first, right? We're not porting anything. What we're doing is we're providing ELF compatibility in the, in the Windows kernel, right. right? So you're natively running those executables on yeah, Windows, so right? Reverse wine, right? Yeah. Yeah. Cisco level interpretation. Yep. So would that enable you to take Linux 
binaries and make use of them on Hyper-V natively. So that absolutely. you can run your entire stack on them. In, in theory, absolutely. Now, I, we haven't done extensive testing in that area yet to determine you know, if yeah. exactly what it is. But from uh, the, the preview releases, uh, or the, the discussions that were recently, I think it was at, at Build, um, that is possible. I would assume, you know, depending upon what application it was, there could be some issues. But in theory, yes, you so can run. Just to really clarify, this bash on Windows is mostly for developer scenarios, OK? Mm -hmm. So for example, you have it on Windows 10 today. So is there a limitation where you can't open Yeah, sockets, so um, unless you want to run server applications on Windows 10, of course, it doesn't necessarily uh, help too much on, on the server side today, OK? The future. Who knows? But for the time being, also in terms of terminology, uh, the, the kernel is specific Windows kernel. Okay, so you have all the new type of um, uh, user space tools running directly on the Windows kernel. So one way to call it is, for example, GNU slash KWindows, for example. Um, and Ubuntu, of course, canonical is providing all the support and all the user space binaries. Very interesting thing, for example, this uh, this work allows you to run. Uh, um, Primitives like Fork, which are traditionally not available on, uh, on Windows, do the difference between how the processes work. Win32 processes work compared to F type of uh, binaries and uh, Linux processes, okay? Okay. Great. Go ahead. Last question. Uh, from an operational perspective, if I'm running Hyper-V and Open Vswitch and hmm. two VMs can't talk to each other, yeah. wh who do I call? Who do you call? Uh, do I well, call I, I give you my phone Microsoft number. Microsoft for support, <laughs> or do I call CloudBase? You would call CloudBase Solutions. Okay. okay, and then they would reach out to Microsoft? If we, so if to be clear. It, or I'm just curious from a support perspective. Mm -hmm. we, we work very closely together mm -hmm. to ensure that these technologies work, right? CloudBase Solutions will be your support provider and our partner to deliver that support to you. Mm -hmm. Okay. okay? Uh, but I assure you that technology is getting tested in our continuous integration infrastructure, and, and we work extremely close to ensure that uh, we're going to deliver a great user experience to you. Okay. Thank okay. You. Thank you, guys. See you later hey. at the parties. Thank you, everybody. Yeah.